new news from Idaho regarding Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, as well as a Moscow, Idaho update. Some thoughts on the Delphi case. SBF, for someone who thinks he is so smart, man, is he making some dumb mistakes. Should this cop be fired? You take a look at the video. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Hit that little bell so you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, before we get to the docket, let's support the people that support Crime Talk. Like many Americans, we got a dog during the pandemic. My quarantine dog, Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Now, Miss Winnie has grown accustomed to being around us all the time. When we were leaving the house, Winnie would have extreme anxiety, so we decided to look for natural products to help with her anxiety. We looked for the highest quality CBD treats, and we were not satisfied, and neither was Winnie. So we created a high quality CBD product that absorbs faster and provides the required results faster. Baked in Colorado CBD treats and beverage enhancers are made with nanotechnology. The nanotechnology makes the CBD extraction more pure, also allows for Baked in Colorado products to work faster. Baked in Colorado products can help reduce your pet's anxiety, ease joint pain, and help with your dog's skin problems. Go to our online store and see what Baked in Colorado product is best for your dog. When you order at bakedincolorado.com, enter code WINNIE and receive 15% off your first order. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. If your dog does not experience the desired results in 30 days, return the product and we will refund your money. No questions asked. All right, let's go ahead and open the record for December 29th, 2022 and begin our docket. First on the docket, we brought you news yesterday that uh, Chad Day Bell, through his attorney, Mr. Pryor, was going to be asking for a continuance. And it was some pretty vague news, and that's why I always like to read the actual motion before you take you know, everybody's word for it. Frankly, this is the reason why we started this channel. So many people in the news don't really know what they're looking for or what it really means. Case in point. So what is the real reason why Chad Day Bell doesn't want to proceed to trial on April 3rd? Well, first, the first stories came out was that he needed time to properly prepare for the juror questionnaire and that he was not going to be able to do that effectively given the short time because he hadn't really begun his mitigation efforts on behalf of Chad Day Bell. Now, oftentimes in a mitigation case, it's, oh, the person was uh, in a disruptive household where there was drug abuse, there's drug addiction, abuse, etc. you name it. Other times it's simply, hey, the guy lived a great life, uh, normal childhood, no abuse, lived the American dream, and then got wrapped up with somebody. It's not that particularly difficult to do. And I just can't imagine why two and a half, almost three years into this case, none of this has been developed. It really makes you wonder what Mr. Pryor has been doing. I'm assuming he's been working on the case, but you know, you start to lose interest in a case when you're not really getting paid for it. And maybe that's what's taking place. And, but here is the real reason why Chad Daybell is probably going to get his case continued. As you may recall, and Mr. Uh, Pryor puts in his motion, that on September 27th of this year, uh, Mr. Daybell submitted a motion to continue the trial date, which had then been set for January of 2023. In response to that motion, he notes that the state filed a motion that supported continuing the trial date, arguing that there is good cause to continue the trial date for both defendants, given the complicated statutory issues with defendant Vallo, i.e. competency issues. And he then points them to the, uh, the state requested a trial date in the earliest of fall of 2023. So we're talking like October, right? unbelievable to me. In granting Mr. Daybell's motion to continue, the court noted that many reasons that additional time is needed to prepare for capital trial, including the constitutional rights of effective assistance of counsel, the required individualized sentencing proceedings associated with a capital case, and the need for experts and development of mitigation 
evidence and ultimately concluded that the defense has indeed demonstrated that it is not and cannot be ready for trial in January of 2023. And then he cites to that motion. The interesting point of this motion is a footnote. That's where the real news comes from. And it says the court also noted that purely speculative arguments that some other attorney may at some point join the defense team and the new attorney would need time to prepare. At this time of filing of the motion to continue, Mr. Daybell has not yet requested the appointment of an additional capital qualified attorney to the defense team. That's why the court said that it was speculative, right? And this one sentence, he has now done so and the reason is no longer speculative. So it seems like a pretty much certainty that Mr. Daybell will get a second attorney, appears to be a court appointed attorney. Mr. Pryor may be court appointed at this point. And so that little footnote basically says it all. He needs another attorney and that other attorney is going to need additional time to get up to speed, review the discovery, uh, strategize a theory, a theme, uh, develop motions issues, etc. So assuming the court grants this request, which it seems unlikely that the court would deny such a request given the severity of the punishment in a capital case, that it'll be granted, that the attorney will be appointed, and then that attorney is going to need time to be prepared. So unfortunately, although I think two and a half years, three years, in the making, why was this request not made a year ago when this case was originally filed as a death penalty case? At some point, the court is going to have to admonish counsel for this lackadaisical performance as it comes to uh, requesting the necessary materials and uh, counsel uh, that they need to prepare for a case. But unfortunately, that's the news right here. It looks like Mr. Daybell is going to get new court appointed counsel or at least additional counsel. And if that in fact takes place, that counsel needs time to prepare. The court would then be violating Mr. Uh, Daybell's right to effective assistance of counsel if they did not give them time to prepare. So my prediction is unfortunately, Assuming there's new counsel appointed, which I think he will, the trial is going to get continued probably until the fall of 2023. That's why you got to always read the motions. You got to be careful what you just read from the headline, so to speak. All right. In other news, police may be warming up to the idea of releasing a 911 call in the unsolved slayings of the four University of Idaho students. The Moscow police chief, James Fry, floated that possibility of making the recording public. He said, quote, I think it will be released when the prosecution believes that we can release that, uh, the chief said. And uh, the call also said a little about that other than that it was placed from the surviving roommate's phone and that multiple people spoke with this dispatcher. And he said, well, that could be released at trial or maybe before. Somebody needs to get on a single page out there. Uh, listen, it's a cold case. I don't understand why they don't release more information. I know, Scott, is it really a cold case? Listen, we're now seven weeks into it. No direct suspects, no hot leads. It's a cold case. The chief also declined to say whether anything specific on the call could help detectives make an arrest. He said, quote, I can't discuss that. It's part of the investigation. But as soon as we can release that information, we will. Police have said that uh, just before noon on November 13th, someone called 911 to report an unconscious person in the King Road house. Officers arrived to find Maddie Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves and uh, Zaina Carnodal and Ethan Chapin all deceased uh, in the house on the second and third floors. And the county coroner, Kathy Mabit, later said all of them suffered multiple stab wounds. Two other housemates were, where rooms were on the bottom level were apparently not attacked. The police chief came under fire earlier in the investigation after assuring the public that there was no ongoing threat after an unknown assailant went into the off-campus rental house and obviously fatally stabbed four likely sleeping students and then escaped without a trace. You can understand that. I mean, there's a quadruple murder on the loose and the chief's telling people, don't worry about it. Nothing to worry about here. Don't worry about it. Now, the chief also said that the tips coming in so far have surpassed 17,000 tips uh, as the case nears its seventh week. Police uh, released few new details 
after announcing on December 7th that they were looking for this white Hyundai Elantra, uh, which is between the 2011 and 13, and the police believe that that type of car was near the crime scene around the time of the slayings. And the Moscow police have avoided answering questions about whether they actually have photographs placing that type of vehicle at the scene and have released only stock images as they ask the public uh, for help in tracking down the driver. There's been some records released out there that indicate there were 90 similar cars registered to park on campus, but police have said they were working their way through a list of 22,000. I would think that the uh, 91 on campus would be a good place to start. Just saying. And next, yes, the tarot card reader from Texas who has uh, tried to pin the homicides of the four students on a professor, despite the fact that the police have said she wasn't even in town and there's no reason to uh, suspect the professor um, of being involved in the homicides. Well, says that uh, she expects that the defamation case against her will ultimately uh, be her vindication. Now, as we brought you the day, Rebecca Schofield, an associate professor and the chair of the history department at the University of Idaho, sued this supposed TikTok personality, Ashley Gillard, earlier this month for defamation. Gillard took on social media to implicate Schofield in the murders uh, back, that obviously took place in November. Now, Gillard said that Schofield is behind the killings and told um a news organization in an interview that she thinks the jury is ultimately going to believe her. She said, quote, they will see in court why it is true. When I go to court, they will see the evidence and they will see how I connect the dots and they'll make a decision as to it pertains to whether they want to continue to live in blinders or believe it. If they don't, I don't care. Well, actually, she's going to care because um, guess what? Her little connect the dot is not coming in. She said she got it from tarot cards. That's about as reliable as me referring to the magic eight ball. <laughs> well, judge, the magic eight ball said it was true. You would get laughed out of court. It's not coming in. Miss Gallard needs to get for real. She needs to get herself an attorney. And I hear they're expensive, 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 expensive. Now, Schofield accuses the uh, Texas TikToker sa who says she's never met her on damaging her reputation as a professor and endangering her and her family. And the Moscow Police Department has not said whether criminal charges are being considered against any online sleuths, but officials have indicated that the rash of speculation is taken focus away from solving the actual murders. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. It's all your fault. If you have any interest, if you've given a tip or you are looking into something, it's all your fault. If the police hadn't been dealing with all of your uh, crazy theories, uh, the police would have solved this case by now. No, no, no. So, like I said, the case is cold. Um, think of this fact. I thought it's a little disturbing. Just 54% of all homicides were cleared through arresting and charging suspected killers in 2020. That's the most recent information we have. That's marking the lowest murder clearance rate on record. Think of what that means. We're right now on the edge of becoming the first Western nation to allow more murders to go unsolved than are actually solved. Think about that for a minute. Let that sink in. What the hell is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Think about it. Leave me a comment below. Next, a couple of questions in the Richard Allen case as we come to the end of the year. Obviously, Mr. Allen was uh, charged with the murder of the two teenage girls uh, from Indiana, and his arrest was the first uh, real development in years in the 2017 cold case. Now, Libby and Abby were obviously found uh, deceased in the woods in Delphi, Indiana on Valentine's Day of 2017, which led to a multi-year investigation of this small community, leaving a lot of people pretty hopeless. However, the suspect apparently was right under their nose, and it was revealed that Mr. Allen worked at a pharmacy as a technician at a local CVS and remained in the tight-knit community before he was implicated as a suspect in the murder. So the big question is, is, is somebody else involved? Now remember, prosecutors revealed back in late November following Mr. Allen's arrest, there, there may be another suspect involved in the slayings. 
At the November hearing, the Carroll County prosecutor, Nicholas McClelland, argued against unsealing the documents, claiming it would jeopardize the investigation. The prosecutor the prosecution apparently believes that Mr. Allen is not the only suspect involved in the homicides. The prosecutor stated, we have good reason to believe that Allen was not acting alone, that there could be other actors. This is from the district attorney, Mr. McClellan. McClellan also argued that if an unredacted affidavit was released, witnesses in the investigation could be harassed. Now, after the hearing, Allen's attorney said that the revelations of the potential second suspect was news to them. If you read the probable cause affidavit, it does not mention anything about any other person. So that's interesting. So when is the prosecution going to let us know or when are they going to file charges against somebody? Now we know, now there's been lots of talk that uh, Keegan Klein, who's been um, held in custody for over the last year on um, unrelated charges, whether he had some involvement and the prosecutors have somewhat whittled away his charges, but there's been no connection. Pretty soon it's going to be time for the prosecution to put up or shut up about their second suspect. Next on the docket, Sam Bankman Freed. For a guy who thinks he's pretty smart, man, he's dumb. So Sam Bankman Freed has had several visitors to his residence uh, where he has been released on that $250 million personal recognizance bond. First, he met last Friday with Michael Lewis. He's the writer who wrote Moneyball as well as The Big Short. Apparently, Mr. Lewis may be interested in telling the story of the collapse of the crypto empire. Mr. Lewis met with Bankman Freed just hours after he landed in California. One could presumably think that they were going to talk about how he went from billionaire CEO to facing up to life in prison in the matter of weeks. Well, then from Mr. Bankman Freed's uh, cushy residence where he's staying his on uh, with his parents, on Tuesday he had a visit from a uh, single crypto influencer who said that he seemed surprisingly optimistic ahead of his trial on multiple charges. Obviously, no trial date's been set. He's due back in court on January 3rd for an arraignment. The question will be, will he enter a plea of guilty or not guilty? Well, Tiffany Fong, this crypto influencer, apparently stayed late into the night during her trip to see the accused fraudster who's hanging out at his parents' house. And obviously, he's been charged uh, with the biggest financial scandal in history. Now, Miss Fong, who specializes in crypto content, is the first person that uh, Sam Bankman Freed opened up to about his rumored polyamorous sex life in a phone call that was first published back in November. Apparently, Ms. Fong met with old SBF at the uh, family's home library and they chat with Strictly Business. Fong said that uh, Mr. Bankman Freed seemed similar to how he always is, adding that he remains surprisingly optimistic, although aware of the gravity of the situation, referring to the potential prison sentence of up to, fi up to 115 years if he's convicted of all charges. According to Ms. Fong, he didn't seem to want to talk too much about the worst case scenarios, and he expressed regret and remorse a number of times during the chat for the customers who lost millions as a result of Mr. Bankman's freed alleged financial misdeed that led to the FTX collapse. He's trying to gather his take on events. He sounded like he was trying to gather his thoughts about what happened, um, noting that Mr. Bankman freed was on his computer the entire time that they talked, but he wasn't a appearing to be playing video games. Now, Mr. Bankman Freed can be on the internet. He just can't make any purchases over $1,000 or more. And he can't leave his home except to exercise, meet with his attorneys, attend court mandated substance abuse um, monitoring, as well as mental health treatment. So he has everybody come to him. And apparently the parents have to approve who the visitors are since, well, obviously it's their house. But you may say, Scott, why is this relevant? Well, it's like we always said, it's always the defendant's own words that come back and bite them in the end. And as we've said it before, somehow everybody thinks that nothing anybody says will be used against them unless they tell it to the police. No, no, no. That's why you're advised. Anything you say to anyone other than your attorney can and will be used against you taken out of context, 
misconstrued. So these visitors, Ms. Fong, Mr. Lewis, guess what? They're now potential witnesses in their case. I guess they could claim that they're reporters and that uh, it was somehow uh, privileged documents for a story of some type. But I think that would be tough to persuade a court that anything that he said, Mr. Sam Bankman-Fried said to the, either one of those, could not be ordered to be produced and be potentially used against Mr. Sam Bankman-Fried. For a guy who thinks he's so smart, he is so dumb. And I guarantee you, his attorneys, who are experienced criminal defense attorneys, told him not to talk about the facts of the case to anyone. But he does it anyway. Because guess what? Sam Bankman-Fried knows better than everybody else. He's the smartest guy in the room. And that's just the way it is. Had a conversation very similar to that today. It's like, you're right. Don't listen to me. You know what you're doing. You're warned, Mr. Bankman-Fried. You're not so smart. You need to start listening to people to know what the heck they're doing. You may be a con man, you know your business, but you got caught, so you're not good at it. So you might as well start listening to the people that are trying to help you. Next on the docket, should this cop have been fired? All right, listen to this story. The Tampa Police Department announced that it has fired patrol officer Gregory Damon following an internal investigation into an arrest he made back on November 17th. The inquiry found that Damon, who is a six-year veteran on the force, violated multiple department policies when he booked a female suspect who's seen in the footage, booked her into custody. So this, this woman, who has not been named by the department, was booked by Damon for sleeping outside a doctor's office and not leaving when employees asked her to leave. It's a simple trespass case. So the police revealed, uh, once they fired Officer Damon, uh, that the officers learned that the actions from police from neighboring Hillsborough County, who, was, who witnessed the incident as well. He was relieved of his duties the next day as police probed the incident. Now, Damon's own body cam captured the incident in question, which occurred during the woman's arrival at the uh, jail in Tampa, which is a receiving facility for alleged offenders. People at the medical office had reported that the woman had been sleeping outside the building and was ignoring requests to leave the property. The same woman had previously been told to stay away from the property by Officer Damon personally, according to the police, and was ultimately arrested um, by the officer at the spot in October on the trespassing charge. Her November arrest transpired about 10.19 a.m. Now, the history in the pair can be felt in just over the uh, five-minute of a video footage which shows the woman arguing with Damon and refusing to exit his squad car after again being arrested for trespassing. She is heard in the clip yelling, I want you to drag me. She's saying this directly to the officer who responds by grabbing the woman's arm and pulling her across the parking lot. The show of force came after the officer forewarned the uncooperative suspect who is still being prosecuted by the city, I'm going to drag you out of this car. And the footage shows the fed up officer taking the woman by the arm, pulling her out of the vehicle, then moving her leg across a long concrete floor towards the central booking room where a sign reading, search your arrestee is seen. Throughout the encounter, the woman can be heard berating Officer Damon. At one point, as Officer Damon drags her, the officer stops and puts down the woman, giving her another chance to stand up. You can hear him say, stand up. Clearly frustrated, Damon says in the clip, as a suspect who is reportedly homeless continues to remain on the ground. The footage from the jail facility, is, uh, which is frequented by dozens of departments in the area, show a more striking angle of Damon's show of force, where he can be seen dragging the suspect roughly 20 feet from his squad car to the booking room. Upon reaching the doorway, Damon presses a call button, summoning the uh, county jail deputies to help bring the woman in the room. The jail is run by officials from the sheriff's office. Now, in the release from the Tampa Police Department, they said that Damon's actions uh, were unbecoming of a senior officer. And the interim police chief uh, said, professionalism is not only expected, it is demanded in every encounter our officers have with the public, regardless of the arrestee being uncooperative or unpleasant in return. As law enforcement officers, we are held to a higher standard. The female suspect was um, booked into the jail and records indicates that the 46-year-old uh, woman provided an address as a Tampa facility uh, for homeless people. Records also indicate that uh, she was released days after a mental health hold. 
The criminal case against her is currently making its way through the courts. The police department's policy on dealing with uncooperative detainees states that the officer should request assistance from jail booking staff if met with resistance from a suspect. And the police said they tweaked their policies way back in 2013 so that Officer Damon should have known about this when dealing with an uncooperative person. Okay, let me know what you think, okay? This is the kind of crap that officers have to put up with. And don't get me wrong, I truly believe in holding cops to a higher standard uh, than your everyday citizen. But when somebody is literally saying, I want you to drag me, okay, be careful what you wish for. I'm kind of of that mindset. What are they supposed to do? Go get a, a uh, wheelchair and wheel this woman in who's been uncooperative, doesn't have anywhere to stay, so goes back to the same place. And they say, hey, we don't care where you go, but you just can't stay here. You need to leave. I don't know. Frankly, Officer Damon, I think this is a good time to go find other employment. I'm sure there's going to be other agencies that will hire you. Um, I've seen some bad cop conduct over the years, and I just don't see this one rising to that level. So I don't know, ladies and gentlemen, I guess you get the police force uh, that you desire. I just don't think this is one that rises to the level of uh, termination. Let me know. And finally today, our dumb criminal. A Georgia man's attempt to rob a business on Christmas morning didn't exactly go so well when he slipped on a patch of ice while trying to get away. Luis Sambocha Ordonez allegedly hid behind a business and pulled out a gun demanding cash from an employee who exited the rear of the building early Sunday morning about 1 a.m. Now, he's been charged with armed robbery and aggravated assault, and police said additional charges are possible, and uh, police said that the uh, attempted robbery led to a physical altercation between uh, Mr. Sambolchuk or Ordonez and the employee who was not named. And I'm just going to say, I don't know if he slipped on the ice and his face looks like this, or if the unnamed employee gave him a good old fashioned, you're not robbing me tonight, uh, Christmas present. Look at that guy's face. It's what happens when you try to take things from other people that don't belong to you. All right. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.